Everybody, welcome to another one of my live speaker series here on Instagram. I'm so excited that you can join me today. Hey, Alif, how are you? So glad you're here. So I've got Dr. Eduardo Harriton joining me today. He is an OBGYN and an infertility specialist. He is also the co-investigator of the Aspire study. He completed an MD and an MBA from Harvard Medical School and Harvard Business School. And he is here to join me. Perfect. And I'll just accept his request and we will go live with him. And I'm waiting for him to just, you're so welcome, Alif. I'm glad you can join me. And we're connecting right now. There he is. Hello, hey. welcome, Eduardo. How are, How are you? you doing? Doing well. Nice to see you, Lisa. Nice to have you. Nice to see you too. So, I just introduced you, but uh, for the audience, I want you to know if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to just type them immediately in the comment box, and we will answer them period periodically throughout our uh, live conversation. You don't have to wait until the very end. Uh, so let's get started. So welcome, Eduardo. I'm so thrilled that you could join me. I know that uh, I've um, been wanting to get you on my live speaker series for quite some time. So I'm really honored to have you and to talk to you more about the Aspire study. But before we dive right into it, I'd love for my audience to know a little bit about you and your journey and why you decided to get into medicine and more specifically fertility medicine. Of course, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we were finally able to coordinate, as you know, probably for you as well. It's been some crazy months uh, with COVID and everything that's going on, but I'm very glad to be here. A little bit more about me. I'm originally from Venezuela, came to the US about 20 years ago, made my way up the East Coast from Florida to Boston, I did my medical school, um, MBA, and residency at Harvard at Brigham and Mass General, and then came out to the West Coast, currently at UCSF. Now, a um, little bit about why I went into medicine. I always like working with people and solving complex problems, and I think medicine was one of those fields where you get to not only think through difficult problems, but you also get to do it alongside people and help people. I think that was something that was really clear to me early on. And, and then fertility in general, I was always drawn to feel toward like your patients were engaged with you in a journey. And that's how I got interested in pregnancy. I love delivering babies, helping moms, you know, through that process. But also you take care of patients through the whole life journey. You're taking care of like teenagers as they're starting to have periods and need birth control or you're taking people in their early 20s, people who are giving birth, you know, first child, second child, helping them through menopause, helping them with cancers later in life for the ones that are unfortunate enough to get them. So it's a nice specialty where you get to take people through the spectrum. And then when I was doing that, I realized that fertility was an incredible field. It was a problem that affected one in eight women. So very, very common or one in eight couples. Uh, and, and it was something where you could truly make a life changing impact. And as a parent, I am very, you know, fortunate to have started my family, but it also helps me really understand what a difference it can make in someone's life. So then what we, you know, I decided to go into this field to be able to better help other infertility build their own families in whatever way that makes sense. And it's an incredible field. We have great technology. We have a lot of growth, you know, and my goal is that over my career, we're going to see more access to care, more patients that are able to afford the treatments that they need and deserve, and then um, hopefully we'll have a, a bigger community. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so thrilled uh, that you are a part of this community. So let's talk about the Aspire study. Tell sure. us what that's about. So the Aspire study um, it's a study that we started at UCSF really early on in March. We realized that this was a new virus and we had truly no data to counsel anybody. You know, we were struggling from the public health perspective to say, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. This is how it's transferred. You should stay apart. You shouldn't stay apart. And it was all very new, very fast. Uh, but on the, on the clinical side, 
as fertility physicians, we shut down our practices, but we really had difficulty counseling patients. Because if you think about it, the virus started in China in December, didn't get to the US until probably February is what we've been hearing most recently. No one who was pregnant and delivered a baby had ever had coronavirus. So we didn't really know. There were a lot of studies that were starting to track women with coronavirus, but it's hard to know if you see a change in a population that got something. If, you know, is it because the virus is causing miscarriages, let's say, or is it because um, the population who's at risk for the virus is the same population that's at risk for miscarriages? So the best way to study this is to follow a lot of people over time and understand how the people that get the virus compared to the people that don't get the virus, and that's where you get the answers. So we started the ASPIRE study, which stands for Assessing the Safety of Pregnancy During the Coronavirus Pandemic. And this is a study where we're recruiting 10,000 women nationwide. We have over 80 partner clinics. We got about 1,000 people recruited already. And, and we, you know, our hope is to follow these women through their pregnancies and then early postpartum period, about a year and a half in. Uh, and we'll ask them to give us anti uh, blood spots. So they'll prick their finger, similar to a diabetic, uh, give us a little bit of blood once a week in the first trimester, and then at further intervals later on, they'll answer questionnaires. And with this, we'll be able to create a data set that not only understands if they got symptomatic COVID, but we'll also check for antibodies to understand whether a lot of these infections were asymptomatic. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to answer the question of how does coronavirus truly affect pregnancy and what we can uh, expect. So how can someone get involved and what uh, does involvement entail? So we're recruiting members between four and 10 weeks of pregnancy. So really early on, because we want to capture that first trimester. The first trimester is the time where the organs develop, where a lot of the bodies like functions are developing in utero. So it's a critical period. And so we want to understand what happens early on. So if you're between four and 10 weeks pregnant, you can go to our website. It's aspire.ucsf.edu. And if you go to my um, account, you have a lot of links there where you can find it. But you would go on, you can learn more about the study. We have educational videos, we have FAQs that explain what it entails then you fill an interest form. If you're eligible, you get invited to participate, sign consents online through DocuSign, and then you're enrolled in the study. We'll mail you a packet to your own home. With that packet, uh, you have some cards where you prick your finger. We have a video taking you through every step. You give us a couple of drops of blood uh, and then put it in your freezer, mail it back to us. It was really important to us that no one had to be exposed to most more risk because of our study. And then after that, what you do is you um, fill out some questionnaires for us that you can do from your phone or your laptop. So it's really safe. No one is exposing themselves to any extra risk by doing this, but it's really important for us to have a community. Um, so that's kind of what it entails, pretty straightforward. That's good to know. So one of the questions I got from my audience was basically if, they tested recently positive for COVID. How long should they wait before, you know, undergoing fertility treatments? Or what if they, you know, just started? What would you recommend? Well, it depends on a case by case basis. Like, you know, do they have any contraindications or comorbidities? I'd say so. People that are at higher risk may want to wait a little bit longer. Um, in terms of starting fertility treatments, I would leave that up to their provider. Uh, some clinics have different policies. Some of them require you to test negative after a certain period of time before they can start. Others assume a period of negativity uh, prior to starting and do it without retesting. So I would ask your fertility provider and see what are the policies of that clinic because they do vary nationwide based on kind of what is surging and then the, the clinic's comfort level as well. Sure. So what kind of advice would you give uh, to women if they are thinking about getting pregnant or are pregnant right now in this, you know, COVID environment? And so, if they do get pregnant, oh, go ahead. Yes. No, no. Well, I would say to people who are thinking about getting pregnant, it, you know, we don't have any guidance from our, you know, parent organizations like ACOG or ASRM. 
which are the American College of OBGYN or the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, that people should not be trying to get pregnant. Uh, you know, we feel like that's, uh, it takes a lot to, to say that. Um, so what we recommend is that you follow precautions like we you should be following even when you're not trying. So you should be wearing masks when you're outside, avoiding crowds indoor, minimizing social contact, practicing social distancing, and then avoiding non-essential travel. Um, so basically trying to stay away and trying not to contract the virus. You know, it's it's a struggle counseling women because like everybody's life is different. Some people feel like they need to travel to see a loved one. And I think managing that level of risk uh, and what you're comfortable with is a personal decision that a couple makes in consultation with the physician. You know, sometimes you can't, uh, often people can't stop working for nine months if they're an essential worker just because they're pregnant, but making sure that you're taking precautions when you can and, and using the right uh, PPE is really important. And then for people who are pregnant, similarly, we want to make sure that you are attending your OB appointments as frequently as possible, understanding the policies of your clinic. We often are seeing that partners are no longer invited to ultrasounds. A lot of visits have become virtual and that's okay, but it's still really important to keep up with those so that you are kind of well managed during pregnancy as well as continue the, the, the precautions that I talked about previously. Got it. So another question that I uh, received was, can a mother, pre um, you know, pass COVID on to the baby via breast milk? So via breast milk, there's no conclusive evidence. You know, I think the main concern during breast milk is that when you're breastfeeding, you have the infant at the breast and you, if you're not wearing any precautions, it's a droplet spread disease. So if you like happen to have secretions that fall on the baby or you cough, you could pass it on that way. And, um, you know, there was a, a, some debate as to whether mothers and babies should be separated or not. Again, I think I leave that up to the individual provider and mom, and I know there's different practices there. If you are going to breastfeed, uh, I would recommend in before and after and wearing a mask as well, so that if you are coughing while breastfeeding, that would hopefully kind of stay inside the mask and it's, it's a way to protect the baby. Good to know. So what about uh, COVID and men and how it relates to their fertility? Can you give us any insight on that? Yeah. So, I mean, the way that I explain to my patients is that we know that high fevers aren't good for semen uh, on a short term basis. So people who are very sick for different diseases, they, you know, they tend to have worse semen parameters you know, right after, uh, and, you know, even for a month or two, because sperm takes a couple of months to kind of progress. And uh, so you might see a temporary dip that's not thought to be permanent. There is one study that was done to see whether COVID could be isolated in the semen of uh, males. You know, I don't really take much out of the study because the way that it was done, it's hard to tell whether the samples were contaminated, how they were collected. There's no methodology in there. There was some COVID uh, RNA found in the, in the semen sample, but it could have been that you coughed into the specimen cup after collecting. So without you know, scientific rigor to understand that it was done correctly, it's hard to draw conclusions there. Uh, so I usually just say probably not a long-term lasting effect or at least not one that we know of. But I think it's one of those questions that we'll kind of answer as we know more about COVID and as time goes by. So do you, do you recommend that uh, people, you know, think about freezing their egg or sperm at this time? What are your thoughts on that? So there's really not much indication for sperm freezing other than impending chemotherapy for cancer. And mm -hmm. So that we usually don't recommend, at least broadly, but certainly something if someone has any concerns can talk to their physician. The, in terms of egg freezing, not recommended right now because of COVID, but for some reason uh, or some people, it might be the right thing. So for example, uh, there are patients who say, I don't feel comfortable being pregnant during COVID. I don't want to... Uh, expose my future baby to the unknown risk that we don't know yet. I would rather 
wait for you know someone like the Aspire study folks to publish their findings to make me either feel better or understand the kind of risks I'm taking. So I'm going to wait a year or two, or I'm going to wait for a vaccine. And for those populations, I say similar to how you would delay if you're waiting to get promoted at work, it might make sense to wait a little bit longer. So if you if you were to take a three-year pause because you want to get some visibility into the risk of COVID and pregnancy, and you are in your late 30s, you know, I would say it's worth a conversation with your physician. You know, I don't think you should do it just because of COVID, but if you're changing your reproductive timeline because of COVID, the same way you would change it because of a job or something else, and you decide that, um, that you want to wait, then in that case, it might make sense to do it for certain people. And it's something that I would look into with you or your partner, or if you're a single man by choice or someone who's just kind of trying to preserve their fertility in the same way that, that you could if COVID hadn't happened. Got it. Yeah, that's great advice. So what's the best advice you could give to somebody about what, and the one thing you want them to know about pregnancy and COVID and fertility and COVID what would be the biggest takeaway right now? So I would say that if you're feeling anxious, that is normal. And, you know, everybody's, you know, in a little bit of a hiding state because of COVID. People who are pregnant are, you know, especially in a tough situation because there's very little data. We're getting more and more data about COVID, its effects, how to manage it, how to treat it. Whereas pregnancy, there's always like this like mandatory nine month lag to get like findings and even then you know there might be subtle developmental issues that don't show up at birth that take a couple years to become apparent in newborn so i think we're in for like a multi-year period of study before we know for sure like are there any um downstream effects that creates a lot of anxiety and that's very understandable so what i tell my pregnant patients or my patients who are trying to get pregnant is if you're feeling a little bit on the edge that's normal it's important to understand how uncertainty makes you feel as an individual and what you want to do with it for some people they still want to move forward with it and they still want to you know stay stay the course, try to get pregnant, continue their pregnancies. That's perfectly fine. We are doing just as many cycles as we did prior to COVID. And, and I think that says that women feel like, for the most part, they're ready to continue on with their, their reproductive plans. For some women, they might want to delay it, and that's okay too. So it's, you know, owning your feelings and understanding how both paths would make you feel and moving forward. It's something that's okay, and no one should be prescriptive about that. I think it's a decision that you should make for yourself and be comfortable with. And the second thing is that you don't have to make this decision alone. Your OBGYNs, your infertility physicians are here. We have these conversations every day, multiple times a day. So we're always happy to be an ally and you know, sharing that decision making with you if, if it is helpful, because it's certainly a tough time for everybody all over the world. Absolutely. It's, yeah, very stressful. And I can't imagine, you know, just going through the protocols, let alone the world we live in now. So will we be able to see the results of your study published? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we'll certainly publish them. We are in the, you know, we're constantly evaluating what kind of data we have and how soon can we publish. Frankly, it's going to be like months to even a year plus until we have enough data from enough women that have delivered to provide some preliminary findings. But our goal is to get findings out to the community we can to help women make better decisions. Um, once, when that happens, I don't know yet. It depends on how good we are at recruiting women, how good the women who have joined us are and sharing with their friends, but the sooner we get a larger cohort, the sooner we'll be able to answer these questions. So now we're laser focused on recruiting women and, and we're very grateful for the women that have joined our study because they, they are really the ones that are making answering these questions possible. Sure. So before I let you go, I you know wanted to ask you, because my speaker series 
you know, I like to ask um, personally each guest about what they do for self-care. I know that you're also, I wanted to mention, an author of a children's book. So you're a, you're a yeah. do-it-all, multitasking man. And, and so where, what do you do when you have time off to decompress? Can you share with us a little bit about what your personal care routine may be, whether you have a meditation practice or you work out? Uh, tell us a little bit about that, Eduardo. Well, Share with us. Time is slim, as you can imagine. Um, I think I watch a lot of lectures. So I have like my bike over here. My house is a disaster. But basically, oh, get on that. Oh, you have a Peloton too. Okay. I, get on, I have a Peloton. So we do, I do some rides there while I'm listening to lectures or have some time off. Or if I'm on conference call, with, I can't talk. I do that. Less classes than I used to with a child at home. But sure. um, my wife does yoga. Uh, which I actually think for people struggling uh, with anxiety, depression, fertility, it actually helps because I think it centers you and it, it really helps you deal with stress in a much more productive way. And also it's good for your body. It's low impact. It's good for the joints. So that's something that she's very good at. You know, my daughter and I just kind of stretch on the side, but uh, a little bit of that. And I think just taking time to yourself uh, to, so important basically reconnect at the end of the day so i like stop working 5 30 and then don't go back online until my daughter goes to bed and those hours of like you know unless i'm on call no one can message me or touch me i think are very uh calming uh, but yeah that's kind of what i do that's great i'm i'm glad that you shared that with us and so i'm really grateful that you were able to join us today thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and our audience but before i let you go tell our audience where they can find you online and again just uh let us know about uh where they can connect with you for the aspire study um and where your links are sure so you can find me at Harriton MD. That's H A R I T O N M D on Instagram or Facebook. And I have a lot of posts about education in terms of fertility, OBGYN, COVID in pregnancy. We talked about Aspire, why we're doing it. So you can find a lot of information there. If you are interested in Aspire, you can find it through my account or you can just find us online directly. It's Aspire, so A S P I R E dot ucsf dot edu you can find a lot more about that and i'm happy to answer any questions about it if you message me directly perfect eduardo thank you so much again for carving the time out and sharing with us and again i wish you much continued success and i also want to thank our audience uh, for joining us today if you have any questions uh after feel free to reach out to him and uh, you'll see a replay of this um, not only on Instagram but on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Eduardo, again for joining me today. Take care. My pleasure, Lisa. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.